So, um, it is seven o'clock, uh, time for, for uh, the presentation. Uh, Pete Rose is gonna present on the lower Cretaceous. Right there. Um, Dr. Rose is the founder and senior associate of Rose and Associates LLP. I'm not gonna do a long introduction. I encourage those of you who don't know Pete, I would encourage you to read his uh, biography that's on our AGS website. I will say that he has enjoyed a distinguished career and we are fortunate to have him share his knowledge with us today. Thank you, you're very kind. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the very kind introduction. Um, pleasure to be here. I think I can just launch into this talk. Last year, uh, I presented a paper here on the Wichita Paleoplane, that, that is the regional unconformity at the base of the Cretaceous in Central Texas, because that project started by integrating Virgil Barnes's splendid geological quadrangle mapping in the Southeast Llano Uplift, I dealt with the Hensel sandstone and Glen Rose formations as separate rock units. By the time the project was completed, I realized that for a regional stratigraphic study, it would have been far better to treat them as two lithosomes that formed one stratigraphic entity, the Hensel Glen Rose stratigraphic couplet. Also, I didn't map the Hensel sandstone thickness over the entire area of the Llano uplift, only the southeastern part. Hence, the present paper focused on the Hensel sandstone throughout the Llano uplift. I'm gonna start with the concept of transgressive stratigraphic couplets on the flanks of the Llano uplift, such as the Hostin Sligo or Sycamore Cow Creek, or the subject of this paper, Hensel Glen Rose couplet. And then I'm going to discuss the counterintuitive inverse structural topography so characteristic of the region and how it's influenced Hensel stratigraphy. <clears throat> I'll review the goals of this project, which are to characterize and delineate the larger Hensel Glen Rose story, the regional distribution of thickness in relation to the paleo topography the underlying Wichita Paleoplane, and the Hensel Glen Rose lithology and depositional environments in regional context. And I'll close by summarizing the main conclusions and outline a few implications, some, an, some unanticipated. The Bureau's 1990 tectonic map of the Llano uplift shows a football-shaped domal uplift with a Precambrian Grenville crystalline core surrounded by a halo of Paleozoic carbonates and sandstone formations. Together, uh, the Paleozoic formations, roughly 3,600 feet of thickness. And a prominent southwest northeastern regional system of steeply dipping normal faults that crosses the Llano Dome, roughly parallel to and genetically related to the Washita overthrust, <coughs> overthrust belt to the southeast. A largely carbonate rim rock of unfaulted lower Cretaceous formations, the Hensel Glen Rose couplet and the overlying Edwards limestone bound the Llano Dome on the east, south, and west. Stratigraphers beginning with Fred Strickland uh, recognized a common depositional pattern, um, lateral gradation from dominantly carbonate sedimentation down dip to predominantly terrigenous classic sedimentation up dip, generating two laterally equivalent lithosomes together making a stratigraphic couplet. This pattern applied to the Hostin Sligo, the Sycamore Cow Creek, and the Hensel Glen Rose. The diagram shows conceptually how the Hensel Sandstone and coeval Glen Rose formation were thought of by people like Bob Lauchs and Dave Amsbury and others uh, on the south flank of the Llano uplift, two lithosomes that formed one time stratigraphic cycle. A stratigraphic couplet. 
we'll return later and extend this cross section northward across the line of uplift, which is one of the primary results of this work. Now, it may seem strange to start a stratigraphic paper talking about tectonics and structure, but it turns out that the paleo topography of the Wichita paleo plain, the weathered land surface that developed across the line of uplift during the nearly 200 million years after the Washita orogeny and before the Cretaceous transgression, turns out it was strongly influenced by Washita fault patterns and subsequent differential weathering. Some of the longer faults have curved segments that served as transfer faults, such as the regional Riley Mountain Fault that curves northwest across northern Llano County, then swerves back to the northeast in San Saba County as the land passes arch, strongly suggesting some strike slip component of movement. These regional faults have substantial vertical displacement in excess of 3,000 feet, such as the Mason Fault, the Riley Mountain Fault, and the Marble Falls Fault. Llano uplift faulted terrains characterized by what to me at least is counterintuitive, the idea that what is now seen as high was low and what was low was, what was now low was, was high. Uh, it, it, uh, working in the area, something like I, I'm constantly scratching my head reminding me of how this is supposed to work. Obviously, differential erosion is involved in which the Precambrian crystallines are much more susceptible to weathering and erosion than are the adjacent Cambro or Division formations. Here's a stop action figure that explains how this is thought to occur. The upper panel shows the uh, Paleozoic succession before Washaw faulting. The middle panel shows the geometry after faulting and the lower panel shows the differential erosion required to achieve the observed geological profile. Note that the gray shading denotes the rock removed by post washita weathering and erosion. The explanation being that the Precambrian section experienced two long periods of near surface erosion, that is Precambrian and Lower Cambrian, plus the Permian to early Cretaceous, whereas the Paleozoic uh, section experienced only one. It's also possible, as John Berry has pointed out, that dolomite may be highly resistant to weathering and erosion in semi-arid climates. And the fact is that the most prominent of these sorts of features features uh, Ellenberger dolomite uh, on the towards the top of, of the feature. But there's one other implication that where you see these sorts of features, the actual, it, it implies that the actual amount of removal of material by erosion could be as much as 7,000 feet, depending on the throw of the fault and also the uh, amount of topographic relief from the top, the high side to the low side. I don't think I've thought very much in the past about how much rock was removed from the Lano uplift. The characteristic elevation change across such fault line scarfs can be quite dramatic, commonly 300 feet or more. Here is the southeast front of Long Mountain in Llano County, juxtaposing upthrown granitic farmland and the foreground against downthrown rocky hillsides of Ellenberger Dolomite in the background. A generically analogous locality on the east side of the Riley Mountain fault block where a low-lying horse block, that's the near side pasture land, underlain by Precambrian, is thrown against a high standing graben block, that's the far side of Ellenberger Dolomite. And for perspective, here is Pack Saddle Mountain, a fault block of Cambrian sandstone and, and limestone down faulted into a lowland of Precambrian Pack Saddle schist and Town Mountain granite. The highest knob is Morgan Creek limestone. The cliffs are Cap Mountain limestone and the lower slopes are Hickory sandstone. Topographic relief here is about 600 feet. Now we're ready 
to look at a base map of the line of uplift focused on the distribution of Precambrian crystallines, that's the dark gray, surrounded by Paleozoic formations dominated by Ordovician dolomites, light gray, and lower Cretaceous formations, the Hensel Glen Rose and the Edwards limestone in white. Those Cretaceous formations form a rim rock overlying the lower rocks on the east, south, and west. For orientation, note the locations of Fredericksburg, Marble Falls, Llano. Sorry, I guess I got out of sync here. Fredericksburg, Marble Falls, Llano, Mason, and Junction. And the rivers, San Saba, Llano, and the Pertinalis. If I get out of sync again, I hope somebody will say, send me up a high sign. The thing that's interesting about particularly the Llano is that the ancestral Llano River that we see on the Wichita Paleoplane occupies almost exactly the same location as it does today. Even though we've had four or 500 feet of Edwards limestone deposited and then eroded in the meantime. I find that really, really kind of amazing. Okay, here is a regional structure map on the Wichita Paleoplane which as we said is the base of the Hensel sandstone. Of course, to the southeast corner of the Llano uplift, the Wichita Paleoplane actually lies at the base of the next older cycle, Sycamore Ham at Cow Creek. The color code of this structure map shows the lower elevations, 700, 1200 feet uh, in blue, green and yellow inter indicate intermediate elevations and tan and maroon show the highest elevations, 1800 to 2100 feet above sea level. The double lines, double AA prime, DD prime, BB prime, and CC prime are traces of four geologic cross sections, which we'll look at later. But I want to point out a few things in this particular map. First, note that the Precambrian outcrop area is generally low lying, 1200 to 1700 feet, whereas the Paleozoic outcrop area is mostly higher, 1700 to 2100 feet above sea level. Second, Note a broad highland in the northwestern part of the map area with two east bearing ridges. The northern one separating the San Saba and, and Llano River drainages, and the southern ridge separating the Llano and the Pertinalis drainage. Third, a low divide wanders across Kimball, Mason, and western Gillespie County, forming the headwaters of the south flowing Kimball Valley, which drains southward towards the Rio Grande embayment. And fourth, the precursor Llano River occupies a well-defined structural valley that fits the present course of the modern counterpart river closely indicated that it, indicating that it occupies the same areas today that it did 110 million years ago when the Wichita Paleoplane was forming. This is an isopack map. We're looking at thickness here, thickness of the Hensel Glen Rose unit, which in the, over most of the Llano area is all Hensel. So now we can appreciate the thickness patterns that are apparent on the Glen Rose ice pack map. Blue indicates thick, green and yellow are intermediate thickness, tan and pink are thin, and white signifies that the Hensel Glen Rose is absent, either through non deposition or subsequent erosion. In most such cases, the white areas designate high standing grobbin blocks never covered by Hensel sandstone. The bold wiggly line that wanders eastward from the south side of the southern ridge is the up dip pinch out of the upper Glen Rose carbonate lithosome. It is projected to pinch out against the elevated southeast margin of the Riley Mountain grobbin block then trends eastward to the backbone mountain graben block where it then turns and trends north northwest along the west facing upper cretaceous cuesta north and west of this pinch outline over most of the llano uplift 
all of the Hensel Gunrose Interval consists of arcosic terrigenous clastics assigned to the Hensel sandstone. So over most of the Lano uplift, the HGR couplet, the Hensel Glenrose couplet, consists entirely of arcosic conglomerates and sandstones derived from the highlands on either side of the Lano River. <clears throat> also, please note the elongate isopack thick that coincides with the present Lano River, suggesting that alluvial fans from the adjacent divides, both north and south, filled in the valley of the precursor Lano River, as well as two other Hensel-filled Hensel mini basins. The Little Lano mini basin between Long Mountain and the north end of the Riley Mountain Block, and the Sandy Creek mini basin between the east side of the Riley Mountain Block and Backbone Ridge. Finally, I call your attention again to the traces of the cross sections A, A, D, D, B, B, and C, C. So now we're ready to extend that earlier cross section that just went from the south of the flank of the Lano uplift to about the, uh, about the middle of the, of the uh, Lano River. We're now able to extend that <clears throat> uh, further to the north across the Lano uplift to the aforementioned Cambro Ordovician Highland in the southwestern San Saba County where isolated thin outcrops of Hensel sandstone and Edwards limestone are present. Now we can see that the Hensel sandstone thickened into the precursor Lano River Valley from both north, northward and southward, where it was as thick as 450 feet. Finally, please note the crosshatched pattern above the, above the present ground surface and below the base of the projected Hensel sandstone. This represents the thickness of Precambrian rock that was eroded from the Lano Valley after Balcones uplift to the present time. After reviewing the 10 publications that describe outcrops of the Hensel formation of the Lano uplift with respect to lithology and interpreted environmental settings, a simple classification seems to suggest itself. The Glenrose lithosome consists largely of carbonate sediments deposited in peritidal to shallow marine uh, settings, whereas the Hensel lithosome is largely terrestrial, consisting of alluvial fan, fluvial, and coastal plain settings, generally fining upward. One of the most distinctive characteristics of the Hensel is its predominant red color, especially in the lower and middle members. So let's go back and look again at this isopack map because we're going to use that as an index map to compare with the different cross sections. We're going to look first at geological cross section A, A prime that runs slantways from south of Menard, southeast across the southwestern flank of the Llano uplift to end near Spring Branch in the Guadalupe River Valley in southern Kendall County. Cross section A, A prime crosses the present Llano River near the origin of its south flowing counterpart, the Kimball Valley. So let's look at, at cross section A, A prime. We're gonna, <clears throat> so looking at these cross sections together with the isopack map lets us begin to integrate thickness and lithology. The Hensel Glen Rose thickens irregularly along its southeastward course and, and acquires increasing, prop, increasing proportions of the Glen Rose carbonates at the expense <clears throat> at the expense of Hensel terrigenous clastic, uh, the, the Hensel terrigenous clastic lithosome. Cross section AA prime crosses the Lano River between Junction and Mason where the Hensel is notably thick and well exposed. Hensel sediments there range from very coarse conglomerates to fine sandstones and mudstones. All are primarily arcosic. The conglomerates contain diverse cobbles and boulders derived from Paleozoic and Precambrian formations underlying the Hensel. That's a photograph at Yates Crossing of the Llano River right along the line between Kimball County and Mason County. Um, it, it basically is very thick arcosic conglomerates preserving in some cases uh, four set giant four set beds 
uh, as you can see. And uh, very coarse conglomerates are present. They're characteristic of that of that lower lower Hensel succession. Commonly, they have those those conglomerates have an arcosic matrix with a scattering of different uh, size uh, class and fragments. The lower Hensel conglomerate here is about 100 feet thick, but it varies widely and abruptly in thickness. Hang on here, I think I've met. there it is. That's the one I'm looking for. <clears throat> the middle Hensel pale, uh, consists mostly of, pedi of paleo caliches and pedicals. The middle Hensel is about 100 feet thick, also consisting of thick paleo caliche horizons with successive zones of vertical root casts and pedicle fragments indicating that it represents a semi-arid seasonal climatological setting. Now we return to the isopac map again to focus now on cross-section DD prime which starts southwest of junction essentially tracking the eastward course of the Llano River all the way to its present uh, junction with the Colorado River at Long Mountain and Big Backbone Ridge. It's important to note the elongate closed mini basin that coincides with the present course of the Llano River across Mason and Llano counties where the Hensel was present as coarse arcosic alluvial fan conglomerates and sandstones up to, up to 450 feet thick, which were stripped away by Llano River erosion after Balcones uplift 21 million years ago. Note that the Hensel is thin or absent across high standing graben blocks such as the James River High or the Riley Mountain Block. <clears throat> or Backbone Ridge farther east. Note also two other Hensel mini basins, the Little Llano mini basin west of Long Mountain and the Sandy Creek mini basin located between Riley Mountain, Backbone Ridge and Blowout Ridge, all high standing bald headed grubbin blocks on which no Hensel is or was present. The first thing you know when you look at cross-section DD prime, the first thing you notice about the Hensel is how thick it is in that central, along that central axis. It thins only over pre-existing, over pre-existing fault blocks. It's also important to note the elongated cross-hatched area in the Llano River Valley below the projected base of the Hensel sandstone and above the present ground surface. This represents, as we said before, the thickness of the Precambrian rock eroded and removed from the valley by the Cenozoic Llano River, mostly after Balcones uplift 21 million years ago. The arrow, that, that's the present ground surface. I'll go back and do this. That's the projected base of Hensel. The arrow here points to the upper fines member. The it occupies about the top forty percent of the of the uh, of the Hensel. So that's a photograph of a good outcrop of the upper fines section of the of the upper Hensel. You can see the capping Edwards limestone at the top of the road cut, and the reddish uh, Hensel sands that represents the middle Hensel. And the lithology of this, it uh, is it's basically a cal calcareous uh, siltstone, a mudstone, with a few thin uh, di discontinuous sledges of, of carbonates. Back to the isopac map again, so, to, so you can understand kind of where section BB prime goes. It goes from south to north on the eastern side of the map area. It passes northward um, from dissected Glen Rose landscapes of the Guadalupe River Valley, northward into the southeast flank of the Llano uplift, across the Sandy Creek mini basin. There it is. 
to cross the backbone ridge and long, long mountain graben blocks. Then it passes northward across the broad carbonate rock highland of the Ellenberger Hills, where no HGR, Ansel Glen Rose, or Edwards outcrops are, pres are preserved if they were ever deposited there. Then it passes on uh, farther north and comes out there in Mills County where you have a typical, uh, that, that's that, that's that northeast facing cuesta or, or should I say southwest facing cuesta of rocks dipping back to the back to the uh, northeast. So section BB prime it starts off in the uh, far to the south uh, where uh, you, you can see uh, remnants of the of the sycamore cow creek section overlain by Hensel Glen Rose uh, couplet. Northward, we cross the Round Mountain High, where Cambro Ordovician carbonates underlie a thin Hensel sandstone overlain by a thin dissected Glen Rose landscape, which pinches out northward, leaving only the Hensel facies to represent the, uh, the Hensel Glen Rose couplet throughout the line of uplift. The Hensel thickens into the Sandy Creek mini basin then pinches out across Backbone Ridge and Long Mountain, then sags into the Little Llano mini basin before pinching out, before pinching out where it uh, encroaches on the uh, Northern Highland composed of the uh, of, of, uh, Ellenberger Dolomite Highland. It crosses the San Seba River Valley where Hensel sandstone overlies Sycamore sandstone. And then passes northeastward into the west facing lower Cretaceous Cuesta in Western Mills County, where Basil Edwards outcrops cap regular Hensel Glen Rose stratigraphy. A couple of geological features to jump out here. First of all, again, note the, the cross hatched area underlying the valleys of Lana River, San Saba River, Brady Creek, and Colorado River, representing, as we said before, post Balcones erosion of Precambrian or Paleozoic rock. And note the topographic lowland overlying Precambrian bedrock always as structural horsewalks. Hard to think about the Llano uplift as being today a lowland area. And I'm indebted to uh, Brian Hunt for loaning me this photograph of a basal Hensel conglomerate near Round Mountain on the Round Mountain High in uh, Northern Blanco County. Uh, and as we said before, the typical succession here is conglomerate at the base, uh, sands, uh, paleo caliches in the middle and the upper fines indicating uh, maybe distal ends of, of, of fan, fan deposits. Okay, one more time. We're gonna look at the ISOPAC map sh uh, showing the trend of section CC prime. It starts in the dissected Glen Rose landscape around the Guadalupe River in Western Kendall County. Uh, Kendall County. It passes northerly across the Pertinalis River near Fredericksburg then crosses over the scattered peaks of the Southern Paleozoic Highland before descending into the Llano River mini basin. The scattered white dot represent the House Mountain and Enchanted Rock exfoliation domes and small high standing Paleozoic Graben blocks like Prairie and Putman Mountains. All of these peaks lie just below the projected base of the Edwards limestone. Cross section CC prime continues northward, moving across the northern flanks of the Llano River mini basin, crossing over the Smoothing Iron Mountain exfoliation dome, then crosses into the western end of the Illenberger Hills Carbonate Highland, where it crosses small, very thin remnants. Uh, remnant out, outliers of Hensel sandstone, Hensel sandstone and Edwards limestone before deflecting northwestward across the projection of the Mason Fault and ending uh, near, uh, near Brady. So let's look at the section now. South remember is to the, this format is to the right. 
At the south end of geological cross-section CC prime, we see a thick dissected hill country section along the Guadalupe River that starts with the lower cycle of the Sycamore, Bear, and Cow Creek. Overlaying by the Hensel Glen Rose where a thin Hensel sandstone underlies a thick lower, lower Glen Rose limestone separated from a thick upper Glen Rose limestone by the Corbula key bed. The Hensel Glen Rose then thins northward, arching over the Cambro Ordovician Graben block that forms the southern ridge, capped by a discontinuous limestone rim rock formed by a string of Edwards limestone outliers draped over Paleozoic fault blocks. Cross section CC prime next crosses downward onto the Precambrian horse block underlying the Lano River mini basin, passing small, high standing Paleozoic Graben block like Prairie and Putman Mountains and the House Mountain Granitic Exfoliation Dome before crossing the Lano River. It climbs northward out of the Lano River uh, mini basin. Whoops. Mini basin. Across projected thinning Hensel alluvial fans to pass the Smoothing Iron Mountain Exfoliation Dome where it crosses under the Ellenberger, did I say that already? Crosses under the Ellenberger Graben block. There. the gravel block that forms that northern ridge across which a thin Hensel sandstone thickens into precursor stream valleys such as San Saba River and Brady Creek before finally declining into the Valley of Colorado River. Once again, we see thick crosshatch zones representing the bedrock that was removed uh, after Balcones faulting. And again, we see the Precambrian terrains to be low lying compared with the adjoining high standing Paleozoic gravel blocks. Here we see a pedestal of Hensel Arcosic conglomerate in the, in the bed of Spring Creek, west of, uh, west of Fredericksburg. And here's a head-on view of a Hensel slump of Caliche and Cap Mountain slabs underlying red Hensel Arcos cutting into flat-lying thin beds of Cambrian Cap Mountain limestone along, along Spring Creek. The local erosional relief at the edge of that slump is about three feet. And in the bed of Live Oak Creek, west of Fredericksburg, Arcosic conglomerate, uh, Hensel, uh, Hensel Arcosic conglomerate lies directly on flat lying Cap Mountain limestone beds. The unconformable boundary represents a hiatus of more than 400 million years. And at Bear Mountain, six miles north of Fredericksburg, a pinnacle of Precambrian granite rises through about 275 feet of Hensel sandstone and Glen Rose marl all the way up to terminate at the base of the Edwards limestone. Okay. So here's kind of the payoff map. This is uh, the paleo topography of the, of the, uh, the unconformity. The Wichita Paleoplane, corrected for present dip. So you're looking at the elevations as it was at the start of, at, at the time of the Wichita Paleoplane. Contour interval is about 100 feet. The light blue represents the Rio Grande embayment. And at the far right, an estuary of the Gulf of Mexico. Green represents elevations of sea level to 200 feet. Cream color represents elevations of 200 to 400 feet. Pink represents elevations of 400 to 600 feet. And orange represents elevations of 600 to 800 feet. You can see clearly the southern and northern uh, ridges. The east sloping Paleo Valley of the precursor Lano River. You can see the low divide, sorry, you can see the uh, south flowing Kimball Valley flowing into the Rio Grande embayment. You can also see the low divide connecting the, the highlands. There we go. The highlands of the northern and southern ridges. Also, please note that there is no Paleo Colorado River. Its present course lay along the coastline of the aforementioned estuary. Finally, 
Note that the southern ridge of the line of uplift was the highest terrain in the entire uh, line of uplift. Conclusions. At the start of Hensel Glenrose deposition about 113 million years ago, the Llano uplift was a hilly coastal promontory projecting southeasterly into the Aptian Gulf of Mexico. And it was formed by two Cambro Ordovician carbonate ridges, elevation in, in excess of 400 feet above, above Aptian sea level, north and south of the precursor Llano River. Hensel consists of alluvial fan, fluvial, and coastal facies, while Glen Rose consists of peritidal and shallow marine carbonate facies. And those formations are the lateral facies of this Hensel Glen Rose stratigraphic couplet in and around the Llano uplift. Hensel lithofacies dominates in the Llano uplift. Its thickness is inversely related to Wichita paleoplane topography. It's conglomeratic at the base, paleo caliche in the middle part and in the upper part, finer clastics. The inverse structural topography of the Wichita Paleoplane begins after Washita orogeny, that generates the, the faulting. It continues until the maximum highs were covered by lower Edwards carbonate deposition 108 million years ago. And it resumes after exposure by Valconi's uplift, even to the present time. The topographic Wichita Paleo Plain mini basins that have max relief of about 450 feet develop preferentially above low lying Precambrian crystalline rock terrains, infilled by Hensel Arcosic alluvial fans from the highlands to either side. And if we look at the Hensel Glen Rose stream drainage, the precursor west to east Lana River dominates as the, major, and the main drainage. But it's flanked to the north by the, by the west, the San Saba River, which is also <laughs> west to east, and the Pertinalis precursor stream to west to east. The north and south Kimball Valley rain, drains the southwestern Llano uplift into the Rio Grande embayment. Today, that, that a stream in that general vicinity flows the other direction. We'll talk about that in a minute. The San Saba River flows into the East Texas embayment, and there's no precursor Colorado River. Now some implications. This is the fun stuff. If we look at the present day, sorry, if we look at the at the regional southeastern slope at Wichita Paleo Plain time, that was that last structure map I showed you. It's about six feet per mile to the southeast. If you look at that same slope today, it's about 25 feet per mile. The implication is that that later increased slope is related to, to the northeastern rise uh, attributable to Colorado Plateau uplift, probably uh, Neogene. So it means that, the, that the, 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 the slope that's attributable to that recent uplift is about three fourths of the slope, 75%. The post Edwards rise of the Edwards Arch far to the south caused the reversal of the Kimball County of the Kimball Valley flow from the southward to northward as Johnson Fork, a modern lateral tributary. The northeast to southwest trend of the South Llano River was determined by underlying regional fault trends. They correlate perfectly with the uh, strike of the Basin Graben. Inverse structural topography implies erosion of as much as 7,000 feet of Precambrian Paleozoic section during the 190 year post Washita hiatus. And the Llano Dome, which has 4,500 feet of closure at the top of the Ellenberger, as a consequence of a, a Washita orogeny, plus about 1,500 feet of Precambrian eroded at the apex near Llano, Texas. So it gives you a total of maximum of about 6,000 feet. So we're getting in the ballpark of how much rock was, was removed. And that's a diagram that captures a cr two cross sections across structural cross sections across the Llano uplift. Uh, and uh, let's see if I've got a, 
yeah, that that arrow there points to the Marble Falls uh, boundary. Uh, this would be the Wichita Paleo Plain, and that would be the Austin Chalk projected. So the bulk of that dome was was gone by the time uh, by, by Cretaceous time. There's still still a slight a slight expression of it, but not a whole lot. So one of the most interesting aspects of this has to do with the evolution of Colorado River drainage. Now, I'm going to start with the idea that, that Bill Galloway and his Cal and his guys uh, suggested that the Colorado River started off from the Lower Wilcox shoreline or near the shoreline, and and eroded headward across the coastal plain during the Eocene and early Oligocene. I had done some work that suggested that it uh, that it got into the the area of the Balcones Fault uh, in in late maybe middle or late Oligocene, uh, and then and then eroded on headward from there. But this suggests then that 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 Colorado River then since since we don't see it any evidence of it at all, and and Wichita Paleo Plain time, then it suggests that that maybe that the Colorado was already across the across the fault before there was a Balcones fault, and that when the fault occurred, that's what causes the uh, entrenchment that we see so prominently from Austin, uh, even up into Barnett County. And then the Colorado River, then the Colorado River captures uh, first of all the the Pertinalis and then the Llano uh, early in that history. In 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 at, in in uh, just during and just after the time of Balcones faulting, and then further erodes northward uh, after Balcones faulting, where it captures the San Saba, Pecan Bayou, and Concho rivers. That's just speculation, but it seems to fit all of the time little time points along the way. And the last thing is that we have up to 450 feet of Precambrian rock was eroded from Lana River Valley after Balcones faulting and uplift. And that I have to say was a real surprise to me that there was that much rock removed just in 20 million years. So the last thing I need to do is to say thank you to a, a lot of my pals. Many of, many of you are here. Uh, that made a lot of suggestions as this work progressed and we could talk about it. You know who you are, more than I can, larger number than I can cite here. Also, I'd like to say thanks to Joel Larden for his illustrations and Elizabeth Sherry for her help with PowerPoints and the manuscript. As always, any errors are entirely my own responsibility. This paper will be published in the next uh, GCAGS journal. Uh, and I also finally need to say that uh no federal funds or or research grant public research grants were wasted on this research or presentation thank you for your attention <laughs>